Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. This is the podcast for November 24th, 2024, which is Christ the King Sunday. Uh, Our readings for today, the first reading is from Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, and then verses 13 and 14. If you're doing the uh, semi-continuous reading, it would be 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 1 through 7. Our psalm is number 93. The second reading is Revelation 1, verses 4b through 8. And our gospel reading is John 18, verses 33 through 37. And as we record this, as we've said uh, in weeks prior, we want to remind you that we are recording this prior to the election in the United States of America. So we have no foreknowledge um, and uh, actually less knowledge than you have. (laughs) Yeah, so who knows how all this will sound, but we're talking about power and rule and Jesus. Absolutely. And so that that is something important to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. When we think about Christ the King and reign of Christ and the ways in which various kingdoms in these passages, all of these passages are portrayed as uh, as those that would be against the kingdom of God. Uh, and so it raises the question of what, of course, Jesus, God's kingdom looks like and how do we how do we determine that and what are the criteria for adjudicating or thinking about when do we know that the kingdom of God is here or or what do we do to bring the kingdom of God is about. So that's a very important contextual and homiletical question for this Sunday as you're reading through all of the passages to recognize that tension that is there in each of those passages with regard to uh, with regard to you know whose kingdom whose kingdom will you you will you have your allegiance Okay. Uh, right. That's what these texts are in essence about for contemporary uh, readers as it was for the original audience. And I yeah, think it's interesting. Oh, oh, go, go ahead, ahead Caroline. Oh, go ahead, Matt. Uh, I just say it's it's interesting to know a bit about where the day came from. That for a long time the church ended the church year with the final judgment and uh, Christ the King or reign of Christ is relatively new after the first world war or just before the first world war around the first world war so about 100 years ago uh it was came out of uh roman catholicism as a means of trying to counter nationalism and help the church mm-hmm. find a different way around so many expressions of european nationalism seeing the dangers that had wrought and one of the ironies now of course is we're looking at texts and certain images that some people take to think about what does what does Christian power look like now in the hands of a nation? And so it's, <laughs> we need in some ways a redefinition of what the day is about, or I would say that the the worship planner as well as the preacher needs to be able to think about what exactly are we celebrating here and what how do we define terms and how do we kind of set the parameters so there's a real sense of like what you were uh, talking about, Caroline, this is, you know, kind of about allegiance to God first and foremost and, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and what that looks like. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, echo, oh, sorry. That's right. You oh, were no, gonna, go ahead, Joy. No, you were going to say something. No, I, I was only going to say uh, uh, what's you know, of what kingdom will you be this uh, citizen? That just restating that. So go ahead. Uh, yeah, that's exactly it. I was going to say that uh, interesting. The word of God is living when we realize that we today need this message uh, all over again to uh, define, as you said, Caroline, to whom is our allegiance? What does it mean to say that Christ is king? And that's what, uh, excuse me, what does it mean to say Jesus is king? Because that's what we're saying when we say Jesus the Christ. Uh, Christ is not Jesus's last name or, or second name. It is an announcement of his title, the position that he holds, and therefore our response 
uh, to his identity. And um, we don't use the term king normally in the United States, but there are places around the world that are still under uh, in kingdoms. That would be how they would describe uh, their leadership and their governments. And so whether we're talking about ourselves or them, um, it is indeed that question that you are asking, Caroline, and that is to whom is our allegiance? And I think too that question of what are the you know what are the criteria what are what are the knowns of the kingdom of God uh, it can as I said earlier can be a, a way into each of these passages, and so if we start with John, uh, here we are in the trial uh, narrative in or the the trial of Jesus before Pilate in John and which is really quite extensive in John and more so than the other uh, gospels. And, uh, and most commentators will divide this trial into seven scenes, or it's helpful to divide it into seven scenes to get a sense of who's on stage and at what time, where's Pilate and such. So this is scene two, and it's the first inter interrogation of Jesus by Pilate. And so those questions in and of itself are important, but it's also recognizing too that it's in this interrogation and in this moment where, you know, Jesus ironically is on trial that you get this language of, of my kingdom is not of this world. And, and my, if my kingdom belonged to this world, because you don't have kingdom of God language in the gospel of John, uh, back in chapter three, but it's really quite rare. And so here you, uh, you get, you get Jesus himself really pointing Pilate to, you know, Pilate, uh, Pilate says, are you the King of the Jews and, uh, your own nation and chief priests have handed you over? What have you done? And then Jesus making the claim to, or the move to my kingdom, and uh, and it, so it's after that interrogation that Jesus brings up this language of my kingdom. And what does that mean? I have a few more things to say about that. But I think the context of that is really important. Yeah, the, the setting is, is so key. He's he's bound. We know he's already been struck in the face. And so Pilate's initial question is quite interesting, right? So you're the king of the Jews, huh? Mm hmm. Right. Your own people have just handed you over. They've already beaten you. They've tied you up. I mean, there's something something probably pathetic or powerless about him already. And so that initial question is less curiosity and maybe a little bit more of a, of a barb uh, as well. And then, but that name's going to stick and people are going to complain about the name when they put, when Pilate creates the sign as well. And uh, all four gospels though, he is crucified as a king uh, right. and therefore raised as a king, as raised as a crucified king. So that's, interesting how that name gets stuck on him in the midst of the trial in all four Gospels. And there's something deeply ironic about it. This is an interesting uh, uh, idea. In fact, uh, there's a scholar by the name of Michael Bates. I believe the book is called Why the Gospel or Why Gospel. And uh, in it, uh, he makes the argument for um, the gospel being Jesus is king. And um, as you know, I'm down here in Montgomery. I've been teaching um, uh, the Old Testament because it's the fall term. And um, we spend all these times using this metaphor, which the ancient people would understand for power and power would be the king. The king's character is how the people represent the king. So when uh, in the Old Testament, we're talking about the character of God, the people bear the image of God's goodness. The people represent the king. Uh, in New Testament terms, we talk about being ambassadors for uh, Christ for Jesus, the King. And uh, this is a Sunday in this text where we can flesh out this idea uh, as you raised, Matt. What does it mean to be king if your own people are not respecting you, are not lifting you up? And I guess the challenge would be, how do we make that central as we proclaim this text 
but also do it in a way where the response is, I will live my life as in submission to Jesus, regardless of how others are living their lives. Yeah. And I think a a couple other things with this text, and now I know we have, what, four other texts we have to I talk about with through the lens of Christ the King, but Pilate's question is interesting to Jesus. What have you done? And Jesus doesn't answer that. Jesus doesn't say what he's done. Rather, he points to who he is, and that is a. I think that's a, a another homiletical move one could take is that, and throughout the Gospel of John, John that's consistent that his acts, his signs are important, but they point at the end of the day, they point to who Jesus is and his identity. And so that's a way, I think, to interpret the presence of the kingdom of God or the presence of, of Jesus amongst us. It's not, it's not the signs. It's what, what's being revealed about what, what is this kingdom revealing about who God is? And then the other thing is I would add a little, you don't even have to add a half, a whole verse. You can just add a half a verse which is, I, I do think you should add, add 38A, uh, because everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And then, of course, Pilate says, well, what is truth? And that is, that, that is an identifier of Jesus' power, of what, what, does it mean, what does it mean to call Jesus king? It means that uh, he testifies to the truth, which is goes back to 114, the word became flesh and, and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And it goes back to 14.6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So that's another direction I think one could take with this sermon as well, is to, to say that the identifier or the marker of the kingdom of God, at least for John, is this Jesus testifying to the truth of his identity and what that means for, uh, for uh, and the fact that he became, it, that he's the word made flesh. Well, yeah, and that, that identity is a particular kind of truth about a particular kind of God, right? So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, earlier, people try to take him, make him king by force, and he gets out of it. He sneaks away from that. Mm-hmm. And here, the conversation to Pilate, right? You know, if if I was really the king of a kingdom that was like yours, right, I would have let my people loose on you. I would have instructed them to fight for me. So when you remember Pilate here holds every card, every advantage, every inch of, of power uh, in this discussion. And it's a really easy trial for Pilate to put somebody like Jesus to death. And so this is less a philosophical conversation about the nature of kingship and truth. And I think more of Jesus saying, right, I am not one of you. Right? I am not everything that you think is true about how you get mm-hmm. and hold power does not apply to me, which I think it's really important when we look at texts as well, like Daniel and Revelation in particular, which might tempt us to think, well, we're followers of Christ, therefore we get to control stuff, right? So where do you see that in Daniel? Well, you know, Daniel's a a vision of somebody being given power, and that somebody could be, as the commentary is really helpful to explain Mm -hmm. the setting of this during the Seleucid period and talk about Antiochus and this individual, this one like a human being, could be Israel as a whole, could be a particular king, could be an angel. Obviously, in Christian tradition, he's been taken to be a, an image of, of Christ in some way. But his role is to, um, <laughs> is to control stuff. I mean, his role is to have dominion, is to make everybody serve him, to hold dominion. Kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. So, I mean, what does that mean about Jesus and the role Jesus occupies now, today, what does it mean to call him Lord of all? What does it mean when Paul says in Philippians, you know, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that that Jesus is Lord? Is this all of a sudden, now that Jesus is dead and raised and ascended, that now he gets to be like the regular kings of the earth? Or is it a different kind of reign? Like, how are we going to talk about that? How are we going to characterize that? So we don't fall into the trap of saying, all the self-renunciation was great when he was being crucified, but now he's coming back to clean house, right? Now he's coming back to unleash that power that was always his, that he was barely able to hold back like a dam straining against a bunch of rushing water. You know what I mean? I don't think that's what 
Well, I don't think that's, I don't think that's what Christian faith says. I don't think there's a whole lot of evidence for that apart from some passages in the book of Revelation. So I want to be careful about how we imagine this kind of kingship. And for me, the, I'm talking too long, sorry, but here, the commentary is really helpful because it's basically saying all the empires of this world are going to be made subject to this, right? There's a minimizing effect right. in, in the rule of God over the world mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or within the world, let's say. No, and I think that that is an, an important message of and a different kind of um, message and or a different kind of direction that one can take is what does it mean to say that, as commentary says, God is sovereign over history mm-hmm. and that rulers come and go. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, that what is that to be a citizen of the kingdom of God means to claim that sovereignty of God over all. And that's, yeah. that's important. And for the ancients, history is not random at all. It's always controlled by some kind of superhuman force, whether you want to call those fates or deities or whatever. So to talk about Christ as Lord over all or ruling over the nations, uh, I, I think we would understand that slightly differently today. <laughs> it doesn't mean that Jesus is picking the winners of every election or that no. Jesus is deciding which nation is going to go to war with what nation at what date. No. It's interesting, again, reading this against thinking of God as king and Jesus as the incarnate God. In that that question, Caroline, that you pointed out, what have you done, becomes exactly how do we, what do we do in the name of this king? And so if what we do is the sign of the grace of God, the peace of God, and the promise that that peace will be made available to everyone, we don't look like other kings. And that's exactly, uh, well, that leads us into what is not the election. And that becomes the question of how does Daniel interpret the verses that of of what this what this being is and what this what this uh, uh, king uh, this beast is. When we get into the interpretation uh, that is in the text, it causes us to ask different questions. Just as we are answering, or we are noting that Jesus is answering Pilate's question differently than we would, and I think that fits with what you're saying, Matt Matthew, that we we aren't we aren't answering this question or living it out the way scripture is calling us to in a way that lifts up the good character of God. Yeah. I like how you contrast joy the, the, that we've just had a series of these grotesque beasts in Daniel. Yeah. And now here comes a human being, which I like that, right? For me, that's suggesting that the kind of authority figure here isn't something <laughs> grotesque or right. predatory it might be something, someone that's actually um, merciful, humane. You know what I mean? That that's yeah. what what differentiates a human being from like a dragon coming out of the sea. I would hope one thing would be empathy and and mercy and compassion. I mean, the text doesn't go there, but it's very interesting that it's not a different beast or it's not a lion. Even no. it's in, in the symbolism of Daniel. Yeah, yeah, and that idea of what. And that's why I tied it back to what have you done? When Jesus does answer those, or when Jesus does answer the question that John's disciples ask, are you the one? It's look at the things that I have done. Yeah. And what are the things that, um, as you were talking, I, I, I confess, what are the things that the King God asks of God's people? And it is, that they don't steal, they don't lie, they don't uh, bear false witness, they treat their neighbor well, they don't covet. The, yeah. I'm, I'm listing the Ten Commandments. And so that's what worshiping, serving the true king is about. And we love the glamour of the beast. And what overwhelms the Holy One? Are we actually the alternative? I appreciate the link, um, uh, Matt. Are we the alternative flesh that is not grotesque, but that is good? And by good, I mean just and humble. Yeah. 
which is a good segue, I think, to Second Samuel. Thank you. Because there you do have the, you know, this song of David of characteristics of God's reign, right? Which fundamentally uh, is known by just by by justice. The divine rule is just rule. And uh, and then also what the commentary helps with as well is that 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 just that justice or that just rule is in part defined by abundance or or particularly the everlasting covenant or the the longevity of the covenant. And so uh, there's a there's an arc of God's justice, right, mm-hmm. that is marked by uh, that is marked in part by covenant mm-hmm. and commitment mm-hmm. and uh, and what does that look like in the context of thinking about the kingdom of God or God's reign when you when you mark it with just uh, just rule covenant rule everlasting rule commitment longevity and abundance uh, those are I, I think those are worth thinking about as well. And in the in the context uh, of of just verse four, that um, and and I acknowledge that we're recording this j- just as um, the Gulf area and Florida are trying to figure out whether or not Milton is going to come and be full force when it hits hits land. And what is this goodness? But the light of the morning, the sun rising on a cloudless morning, gleaming from the rain on the grassy land, which takes the things that are storm and tells us in the character of God, in the justice of God, the storms are not chaotic. The storms are beauty uh, or excuse me, creation is beauty. Uh, and, And so the beast idea versus the humane idea, this storm idea versus the beauty idea, the philosophical truth that we can fight about, or the practices of justice and mercy that cause us to recognize that maybe we don't have to be enemies. I can't think of an authority figure that's ever made me say, this is like the sun rising on a cloud this morning, gleaming from the rain on the glass on the grassy land. <laughs> In other words, it's very aspirational. <laughs> yes, yes. But we're heading into a season, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the psalm? The, yeah, the psalm. Uh, I actually, <laughs> this is a psalm I would maybe preach on because it also gives us entry into thinking about what does God's, what does it mean to call uh, God king or think about the kingdom of God or the reign of God or the reign of Christ. And, uh, and I would maybe even do something really different and kind of take each stanza Mm -hmm. and say, what is it? What is the psalmist saying about that? The Lord is king. Um, So it's a a very different kind of sermon style for me, but uh, it might fit with what what else is going on in the service, depending on how you're trying to mark this day. But uh, particularly uh, God, you know, the Lord has established the world. Uh, that's God's king, kingship and it will never be moved. And so there's, there's, I think there's a lot of uh, imagery here that you could just walk, walk through and say, what does it mean to say, you know, the reign of the reign of God looks like this or that the Lord is King. What does that mean? So something very different, but that's what I would do if I were preaching on the song. If you're preaching. And what does it mean for majesty to not be glamor and glory, but to be goodness and justice clothed in majesty? And particularly in the face of chaos, right? In the chaos yes. of these waters. and mm-hmm. Yes. Mm-hmm. I would preach on Revelation one if I was up this week. And what would you say, or what some what are some of your ideas? Well, I would go at I would talk about nationalism in general. Oh, <laughs> I would talk about verse six. What does it mean that we that, that God has made us a kingdom 
and I would just dig into that word a little bit. I I, I like the word. Well, I, for this Sunday, I prefer Reign of Christ because mm-hmm. I think it's more useful way to help people get into the yeah. the issues here. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to Jesus preaching the the reign of God or the kingdom of God, I like the edge of that word. I'm not a fan of of kingdom, which some people are prone to say these days, simply because they didn't kill Jesus for announcing a new kin. They killed Jesus for announcing a new kingdom, and I don't want to lose the conflictual edge mm-hmm. of his of his gospel in the first century. Mm-hmm. So here you've got you know past, present, and future, really present, past, and future in Revelation 1. You've got reference to Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. That's a reference to his death, Mm -hmm. the faithful martyr. Firstborn of the dead, that's a reference to his resurrection, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, one who's now exalted. So the one who's exalted is still the one who's crucified. Mm -hmm. Now that gets you race, right? Mm -hmm. So to use language elsewhere in Revelation, John's expecting to see a lamb, a lion, but instead he sees a wounded lamb or a lamb as standing as if it had been slain. So even, even re- a book like Revelation doesn't fully want us to see Jesus as just nothing but strength and power. So I would want to explore that image of what does it mean that we are now made a kingdom, we are now made a reign by a crucified and raised and now ascended Savior. And just talk about, I don't think this means we get to have our hands in the levers of power. This doesn't mean we get to dominate over our neighbors. This doesn't mean we've been called to reclaim the world in our own understanding of what God's preferred culture might look like. But to talk about the scandalous edge of that, right? And talk about the church as always being an alternate society of a kind, no matter who is ruling in your nation's capital. I just would want to explore that a little bit with the language that Revelation gives us and reminding us of the um, the humility and and self giving that's always a part of of this king and this kingship and the reign that's associated with him. So if we're going to use that language, what are we going to center it in? Like who's the Christ in which we root? What that even means? Anyway, that's my sermon. I hope you liked it. I'll be passing the offering plate now. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.